right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our webinar walk along the Detroit Riverfront. We are thrilled to have you join us along with our partners from the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. My name is Sarah Halson, and I am the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon, an organization dedicated to fostering the appreciation and conservation of birds and the environment that we share. We could not do the work we do without our funders and members. So I wanted to add an extra thank you to those of you who are members of Detroit Audubon and supporting all that we do. Some quick Zoom housekeeping before we begin today. You are able to control your video and microphone in the bottom left of your screen. We ask that you keep yourself muted so that we do not receive feedback from your microphones. You can open the chat box by clicking on the chat button on the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please add any questions that you might have into the chat. If you have any further questions, uh, please reach out to myself and I will do my best to assist you. I am thrilled to offer this Detroit Riverfront Virtual Walk webinar along with our partners, like I said, from the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy. Um, we have Elaine Elliott, who is our public, their public spaces coordinator, and Rachel Bush, the public, public spaces assistant. Elaine will be starting this off this morning. Thank you, Elaine. No problem. Thank you, Sarah. Um, again, welcome to everyone who's joining us this morning. Um, so first things first, before we get going, I want to orient you all to what, what spaces we'll be talking about today. So this is an image of the Detroit Riverfront. Some of these are spaces that the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy manages, and then some of these aren't. Um, today, we'll be specifically talking about Cullen Plaza, which is where you see number four. We'll be talking about Milligan State Park, which is managed by Michigan DNR. That's number six. And we are also talking about Gabriel Richard Park, which is located just east of the MacArthur Bridge, which takes you to Belle Isle. Um, and that is number 10. So this is kind of a landscape of where, where we are today. The numbers that you see um, in color are spaces that Detroit Riverfront Conservancy manages. And I'll talk um, a little bit more about that. So Sarah, next slide, please. Thank you. So Detroit Riverfront Conservancy is a nonprofit organization and we are responsible for building, maintaining, um, and, and securing the Detroit Riverwalk, as well as a number of pocket parks. Some of those were highlighted on the map previously. Um, we were formed in 2003 with this mission and the first part of the Riverwalk opened in 2007. Um, we are currently in our final stages of completing the Riverwalk. Um, the, the entire vision for the project is five and a half miles. We currently have um, about three and a half miles fully completed. So we are most certainly looking forward to the, to the continuous walk uh, opening to the public soon. If you have not been before, I strongly encourage you to check it out. Um, the image you see here is a photo of Cullen Plaza is where we will begin our, our walk today. Sarah, next slide. So if you aren't familiar with what the Riverwalk used to be or what the, the riverfront in general used to be, um, this is an image of Atwater Street, which borders um, the riverfront right now. It, as you can see, it used to be storage for um, concrete, different rocks and salts. The riverfront was not accessible at all. Sarah, next slide. And this is an image of what it is today. Um, so you see Cullen Plaza right in view and then Milliken State Park, which borders Cullen um, right next door. So as you can see, we've been able to make a lot of transformation. We've added a lot of greenery to the riverfront, which um, was not there before. And Rachel Bush will talk more about what that means for, for wildlife habitat. Sarah, next slide. And this is a look of uh, or a look at Cullen Plaza itself. It was actually a parking lot before, which is quite interesting to think about. This whole area um, has been updated. Next slide. To look like this. So now it's a plaza where folks are able to come, enjoy, um, get a closer look at some of the wildlife around um, the Detroit River. And really, it's become a family space. And I will pass it off to Rachel or Sarah, sorry. That's okay. Um, all right, so the Detroit River region is at the intersection of two major migration routes. Um, those are the Atlantic and the Mississippi flyways. 
So it makes it a very a prime area for bird watching. And throughout the year, more than 300 species of birds live in or regularly migrate through the area, including 30 species of waterfowl, 17 species of raptors, 31 species of shorebirds, and 160 species of songbirds. So along the Detroit Riverfront, you're likely to see and find all of these more common bird species, which may not immediately draw your attention, but I urge you to take the time to notice things like the beautiful velvety tan coloring of the morning dove, as you hear the whistle of their wings when they take off. Or looking at the house sparrows, they're common for sure, but they are beneficiaries of our own success and they offer opportunities to watch bird behavior as they hop on the ground eating seeds or our leftover lunch. Now pigeons, you can see everywhere in Detroit, especially where they can find food, but they are really pretty amazing birds. They can navigate home even when blindfolded by sensing the earth's magnetic fields and they also use sound and smell and they carried messages for the US Army during World War I and II and saved lives. European starlings are a dazzling bird if you get a close look. Um, in the winter time, they are covered in these white spots. And they are also, if you've seen um, the birds, like a huge flock of birds in the air swirling around, um, that's called a murmuration. And that is um, the bird swooping and diving and wheeling through the sky and it really can be one of the great pleasures during a winter's evening. All right, my next slide. Um, and raptors are birds of prey and they are often spotted along the Detroit Riverfront, but they're often flying. So you need to look up to see them. Um, so sometimes we need to remember to look up. There's so much to see. Um, one of the best ways to identify these birds, and all birds really, is to look at their silhouette. And this is definitely the case when you're looking at a large raptor flying high up in the air. Um, here are a few raptors you might see along the riverfront and their silhouettes. So you get a comparison of the size as well as the wing shape. Um, this can be really helpful. Now, we have a few of the ones that we have here, the, um, it's very common to see bald eagles now flying over the river. It was not so common in the past, um, but there are now many eagle nests in Southeast Michigan, including one on Belle Isle that I believe this is the third year that they've had a successful nest on Belle Isle. If you haven't had a chance to see them, definitely go take a look in the early spring next year. Um, peregrine falcons are the largest fal falcon over most of the continent and they have long pointed wings and a long tail. They're famously found in urban areas like Detroit and you can find them perched or nesting on tall structures because they mimic cliffs. There are also a couple good um, nest cams at the Detroit Zoo has one as well as uh, Wayne State. and. Um, so be sure to look, that's a fun thing to do in the early spring is to check out those nest cams and, and um, watch as the babies, as you see the, the eggs come and then the babies hatch. We are also one of three best places in North America for watching hawks migrate. Often we see thousands of hawks overhead in a single day. Usually that is more down river, but you still will see them travel through here um, along the Detroit part of the Detroit Riverfront. So they travel through here because they can soar on the columns of warm air that rise over the sun warmed air. Although we don't usually see that many along the riverfront in Detroit, there's still so many to see if you look up. All right, I'm gonna pass it to Rachel, I believe. Or no, back to Elaine. So this is an image of Milligan State Park before. As you can see, it was, again, an area that was not accessible for folks to really enjoy. Um, and much like uh, you know, other parts of the riverfront, a lot of it was being used for storage. Um, Sarah, next slide, please. And this is what Michigan DNR has done with the space. Um, you can actually fish at Milligan State Park. So if you're ever looking for um, a place that is downtown adjacent for fishing, um, feel free to check out Milliken. There are a couple of ports there. 
Um, Rachel will talk more about the landscape, but there are a number of walking trails and it's also a really great place for watching and enjoying wildlife. Next slide. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is an example of a combination of different landscape styles. Um, and there are many reasons to choose native plants and plant them in our parks. They provide an almost year round food supply that's critical for migratory birds. They provide shelter, um, shade for uh, shelter for nesting or shelter from predators and they provide new habitat locations. And this is especially important in a location like Millican State Park, where wildlife can gather away from the busy downtown core in a safe, quiet habitat. And especially in a city like Detroit, habitat is constantly changing because of human development or other repurposing, but birds can always expect to find sanctuary in a permanent park like Millican. And it also provides both functionality and beauty in giving um, humans a place to visit as well. Next slide, please. So this is what Millican looks like right now um, and going into the winter time, but the selection of plants still offer nutritious foods like seed pods and berries. Uh, you can see that there are varying levels of height as well um, in the different trees, shrubs, and reeds and grasses um, throughout the park. Next slide, please. So when I walked through Millikan last week, these are some flowering plants that I saw still going strong despite the weather getting colder. Um, plants that bloom early and continue blooming late into the season are really important for insects and birds alike, um, such as these asters and the flea bane. Um, and we all recognize milkweed as being vital for the monarch butterfly life cycle. Uh, the pollinators who also visit milkweed attract insectivorous birds. And in my research for this presentation, I found that there's a significant overlap between um, milkweed and the presence of young quail and pheasants which completely makes sense as I was leaving Millikan, um, I startled a couple of pheasants that were nesting in the tall grasses and they flew out overhead. So it's always interesting to see how birds choose their habitats based on plant life. Um, birds will also use the milkweed seeds. They're silky and fuzzy um, for nesting material. And milkweed is important um, for birds and pollinators alike. Um, it can grow practically anywhere, but it's also at, constantly at risk um, being repeatedly damaged or inhibited by pesticides and frequent mowing or weed whipping of yards. Next slide, please. And these are the seed pods and berries that you will see right now in Millikan left behind on sumac shrubs and hawthorn trees. The hawthorn berries, they provide such a nice pop of color to a landscape right about now when all of the colorful fall leaves have um, blown away. Uh, they also bloom really beautiful white and pink flowers in the early spring. Next slide. Oh, this is just an overview of the different uh, habitats that you'll see at Millikan, the wetlands, the prairie meadow, different height offered by shrub and tree plantings, um, just creating an ecosystem for birds, reptiles, amphibians, and insects alike. Um, it's a really important resource for birds on their migratory journey. Next slide. Okay, back to me. Um, so Millikan State Park offers, like Rachel said, a variety of habitats for birds, including the wet meadow, the prairie meadow, um, shrubs and trees for year round birds like the mallards, um, white breasted nuthatch, the song sparrows, and my favorite, the cedar waxwings. You may also be lucky to see migrating birds like the yellow rumped warbler along with other warblers 
um, in the spring and the fall. Winter visitors like the dark-eyed junco offer a reason to get out and bird even in the colder weather. You may find mallards dabbling and eating in the wet meadow if you venture onto the trails that allow you to kind of snake through the wetland on um, the land and there's boardwalks as well. Um, song sparrows and other sparrows can be seen moving along wetland edges and ducking into dense low vegetation of the prairie meadow. They can also nest in the shelter provided by the plants in the wet and prairie meadow. A wonderful way to get an idea of what birds you might see along the Detroit Riverfront before venturing out if you're not familiar with eBird. Um, that is a website online where you can narrow down your search by a, to a specific location um, and also to times of year. And then you can, you can do it either before you venture out and see what birds you might see, or you can after if you are thinking you saw a yellow rumped warbler, but thinking that wouldn't be something you would see, you can check out whether they've been seen before um, and it kind of confirms your sighting. There's also an online app, the Merlin Bird ID, that is completely free and a really great way to help you um, identify birds that you are seeing. Um, and there's different packs. So there's a Midwest pack that you can download. So I highly recommend those if you're interested in birding and, and um, discovering what you might see. All right. So the red-winged blackbird was a special request of Elaine's to focus on. Um, it's definitely one of the stars of the wetland area in Millican State Park. Um, the male's tumbling conkily song early in the spring is something you will definitely hear. Or, um, and they're perched up on top of the cattails. It's kind of a great reminder that spring is on its way. Uh, so they are glossy black, the males, and they have a scarlet and yellow shoulder patch. They can puff up or hide depending on how confident they feel. The females are more subdued, streaky brown. They keep their nests and their babies protected with this camouflage. So males will fiercely defend their territories during the breeding season. Uh, they spend more than a quarter of their daylight hours in territory defense. They chase other males out of the territory, but they're also known to attack nest predators. And that can sometimes include unsuspecting humans who um, will be walking by. Another well-known bird that you can see along the Detroit Riverfront are gulls. Now there's not actually a single species called a seagull. Uh, the word is just an informal way of referring to any of the species that belong to the gull family. In fact, if there were seagulls, you would think you would also find pond gulls, for instance, or river gulls, or even bay gulls. So the most common gull we see is this middle one, the ring-billed gull, shown in the middle. And it's most often seen actually far away from coastal areas. And some of the other gulls around the herring gull, the Bonaparte skull, the greater and lesser back, black-backed gulls, are also can be seen along the riverfront, but they're often hard and challenging to recognize. Um, a couple more birds that we might see in Millican State Park. Last year, I was with a class of fourth and fifth graders from Boggs School at Millican State Park, and we spotted a great blue heron along the shore. And it was extra exciting for them because their class name happens to be the blue herons. So we watched him for a really long time and the students were just entranced. And it, this is actually one of my favorite birds to observe, especially with uh, classes, because they often either stand motionless or, um, or they wade belly deep, but they're scanning for prey. Um, and when they are walking, they're very deliberate with their steps. So they're really easy to watch and they're big and even using binoculars, they're a great bird for new birders or children to watch. Um, you may also catch these majestic birds in flight and they're distinguishable by their tucked in neck and their long legs trailing out behind. Another bird is the killdeer that is a shorebird, but it often can be seen without even going to the beach. Um, they're just a really fun bird to watch. They run across the grounds in spurts and they stop with a jolt every so often to check their progress or to see if perhaps they've startled up any insects for lunch. And the killdeer are also well known for their dramatic broken wing act which will lure away predators from their nest. All right, 
turning it back over to Elaine. All right, so the next park we are going to talk about is Gabriel Richard Park, which is just east of the Belle Isle Bridge or the Big Arthur Bridge, which takes you to Belle Isle. Um, this park is actually a city of Detroit park that we manage on a lease. And this is a before what that space used to look like. Um, my father has very fond memories of coming to this park and fishing before, uh, before the Conservancy made some updates to it, um, but it is still one of his favorite places. Sarah, can you hit the next slide? And this is what that space looks like now. So if we have any fisher um, women or men on the line, this park still does have fishing ports, but it's also home to a, a just beautiful butterfly garden as well as a labyrinth where you are able to go and relax. Um, it is my favorite park. It's one of the quietest parks along the riverfront. I will let Rachel talk more about habitat, but this is an image of what that space looks like. Um, Sarah, next slide. And I'm passing it to Rachel. Actually, Sarah, could you go back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, this is a picture of the butterfly garden at Gabriel Richard Park at Peak Bloom um, in, I believe, late August or late July, early August. Um, it is a little more manicured than Millican State Park, less wild. Um, and in addition to this beautiful garden, you, there's also a huge arboretum where you will always, almost always find a flock of geese hanging out and resting. This garden, it structurally looks different than Millican State Park, but it has all of the same benefits. Uh, with a variety of natives and ornamental plants. Some of the native plants that you'll see here, um, like that pink flash in the corner, that is coneflower or echinacea. Um, there's also catnip, rubecchia, sedum, butterfly bushes, and monarda. Um, and some ornamentals that you'll see, like hydrangeas and um, some ornamental grasses. And the assortment of trees provide uh, varying levels of shelter as well, including evergreens and service berries, maples, and more. Um, and all of these factors support birds uh, and bird habitat near the water and give them a place to nest, feed, and rest along their migratory path. Next slide, please. So this is what Gabriel Richard Park looks like right about now. Um, you know, the, the leaves have fallen and you can, you can see the, the geese that I was talking about in the, the photo to the right there. Um, but it's a beautiful place to visit year round and go birding. Oh, next slide. Um, so this is a diagram from the Michigan Audubon Bird Friendly Landscapes Guide. I will drop the link in the chat now. So this is a great resource um, if you're looking for inspiration. They have an entire plant list in the document um, for potential additions to your own home garden. And I think now more than ever, we're seeing a pushback against monoculture or the habit of keeping lawns and just a few types of plants in your garden and seeing more residential native landscaping which is highly beneficial to birds and pollinators and people alike. Uh, so in this diagram, you will see the essential elements of a bird-friendly yard, those staggering heights uh, between the trees and the shrubs, um, offering materials to nest with and places to nest, ground covers, which offer uh, flowers or berries early in the season or late in the spring or late in the fall and a variety of different flowers and grasses as well. Next slide, please. So here we have two equally beautiful native landscapes, but one is certainly more wild than the other. So depending on where you live, there may be municipal restrictions or maybe neighborhood associations um, who tend to crack down on this type of landscaping. But my point is that it's completely possible to offer native plants in your landscape 
and keep it looking neat and tidy. Um, and what's really important here is maintaining a high level of communication and creating an understanding about why this is really important uh, to support biodiversity. Uh, so at the bottom, just some guidelines, selecting different levels of cover and height, selecting plants that bloom during each part of the growing season instead of all at once. And um, at Gabriel Richard Park, it's not ideal, but the, the flowering plants have been cut back for the fall. If you are able to, leave those seed heads over the winter and delay your fall cleanup until the early spring so that birds can access those seeds and um, access that nutrition. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, of course, green stormwater infrastructure and native landscapes um, offering biodiversity overlap quite a bit um, using native plants, which have deep, deeper root systems, they reduce erosion, they soak up precipitation, and they fix nitrogen in our soils. Um, so these next couple slides are pictures there are examples of native landscapes installed by our community partner, Friends of the Rouge, in their Rain Gardens to the Rescue program. Next slide, please. This is a great example of how to maintain a wild spot in your front yard while offering a community benefit like this little library. Um, maybe to diffuse tension or negotiate about the height of the plants or others opinion that it looks messy. Uh, next slide. So if you're interested in adding native landscaping to your home garden, these are some local community partners which offer consulting, plant plugs, or seeds. Okay, can't seem to get my video. There we go. Okay, um, so back to um, Richard Park, Gabriel Richard Park. Um, in the picture that we showed previously, you'll see that it butts up right against MacArthur Bridge that crosses over to Belle Isle. Um, and so if you uh, haven't noticed before, you might see these small birds that nest under that bridge. Um, cliff swallows can nest solitarily but they usually find that, they, um, that they'll create gourd-shaped mud nests in a cluster and kind of nest in a colony. And they, you will find them under overhangs um, like bridges, but also um, a lot of other places. You can also find cliff swallows out foraging for insects near the wetlands with flocks of a lot of different kinds of swallows. They forage together. So to tell the difference between the many swallows, it's helpful to look at their tail shapes. So the cliff swallows are square tailed. Um, the tree swallows have a slightly forked tail and the barn swallows have a deeply forked tail. So you can see the difference on the pictures on the right. Um, the beautiful colors that swallows have aren't always, you aren't always able to see those when they're flying, but depending on where the sun is. So it is really helpful to look at the shape of the tails. Um, and then the cliff swallows often forage at a higher level than the other species. So they'll be at the top of a large group of swallows if you see them out foraging for insects. All right, so um, in 2015, the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, the Detroit Audubon, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Detroit Parks Department and the PNC Foundation were involved in an effort to add this birding spot to Gabriel Richard Park. So shown here, you can see it has four scopes, two of which are universally accessible. And these allow for visitors to look for birds out on the Detroit River. Um, there's also an interpretive panel you can see in the middle of the top picture. And that is a panel to help identify birds that you might see along the Detroit Riverfront as, and during different seasons. So you can see it being used in the winter as well as in the summer. Um, but if you do not have your own scope, um, that's a good opportunity to go and look for birds from Gabriel Richard Park. All right, so the next few pictures are of some of the birds that you might see if you're able to go out and look through the scope. 
if I can click forward. So this is, um, if you look out onto the Detroit River with binoculars or with the spotting scope during the winter, you might find a site like this. This is called a raft of ducks, which is a group of ducks hanging out together in the water, uh, whereas a group flying would be called a flock. So ducks spend most of their time during the winter actively searching for food and resting to conserve energy, their fat reserves, for use during periods of harsh weather when feeding time is limited. Birding in the winter, as long as the Detroit River isn't completely frozen, offers a wonderful opportunity to see many different waterfowl gathered together. Except for when they dive underwater for, duck, for food, ducks are relatively easy to observe with a scope and learning to identify them takes a bit of practice, but it's worth it. I'm gonna go over a few of them here, but I wanted to mention that we will be having a webinar in, the, in January, February, we haven't selected a date yet, but that will be a more in-depth webinar on the winter waterfowl. Um, and we will be partnering with Great Lakes Audubon and Ducks Unlimited for that one. So stay tuned. But you can see even looking here, there's a few ducks in the front that are very similar, but you can see the, if you look in the foreground that there are some differences. So I will go into some of those. So the canvas back is a large big headed diving duck with a gently sloping forehead and a strong and thick neck. And their silhouette actually has kind of a seamless look from the top of the crown all the way to the tip of the bill. And that gives them the name they're often called the aristocrat of the ducks. So the male on the left has a rusty colored head and neck and a bright white whitish body with black on either side. And the females are more of a pale brown overall, but they still have that same aristocratic head shape. While on the water, canvas backs have an oval shaped body and a short tail sloping gently into the water. Canvas backs often form the large rafts with other canvas backs, or they sometimes mix with redheads or others, which we'll see on the next slide. And Detroit, um, Belle Isle and Detroit River are a really great spot to find big rafts of canvas backs. All right, the redheads are a medium sized diving duck. And these I often would get confused with the canvas backs until I started really looking at the shape. Um, so they have a smooth rounded kind of a cute duck head shape and a large bill. The males have the cinnamon colored head, a black breast and a tail and then a gray body. The females have the same shape but they're more uniform brown color. You'll find redheads in large rafts in the winter like I said um, and often along canvas backs. I um, um, now, but when once you look at them close next to each other, it definitely is a lot easier to see the difference. And this red is a lot brighter color than the canvas back. Next, we have the common merganser, and these are a streamlined shaped duck, and they have white bodies, dark green heads, and a slender red bill that can stand out among the other ducks. The females also resemble resemble an immature male but they have the rich cinnamon colored heads and a short crest, which is really cute to see. In winter, they can be found in large flocks mixed with other ducks like the common golden eye and the bufflehead. The word merganser comes from Latin, roughly translating to plunging goose, which is a good name for this large and often submerged duck. It's common to see gulls or even a bald eagle eel follow them and try to steal fish from these ducks when they come to the surface. So I, clean, I included these two on the same slide because they were another uh, group of ducks that I found confusing to distinguish. So the buffleheads are the tiny ducks with a large head and their white over on this side and their white and black contrast stands out on the water. They abruptly will vanish and reappear as they feed and they spend half of their time underwater. So when you're looking for them, scan the water carefully and be patient. Now the hooded merganser is definitely an extravagantly crested crest for a little duck with a thin bill and a fan-shaped collapsible crest. So this crest will collapse and open and close. The head can look oblong and oversized for the body. It's larger than a buffle head and the top of the crest is black. Um, so those are two distinguishing features. 
The black head has a large white patch that varies in size when the crest is raised or lowered, but it always stands out. So these are just a few of the waterfowl that can be seen on the Detroit River. Um, I am definitely not an expert, so I, I wanted to show you a few of them, but please visit us out or visit the Gabriel Richard Park and the birding station and check them out. Um, also uh, reach out with any questions. And I think that is the end of our presentation. So we'd love to take any questions that there might be either in the chat or add